Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin today. Father, we thank you so much for your presence here today and for the opportunity we have as your people to come into your house. And now as we turn our attention towards your word and towards this final passage of Samuel, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts. I pray that you'd convict us of our sin and I pray, as always, that you would help us to be the people you've called us to be. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So amazing job this morning. I really enjoyed the praise and worship. It's always good to have Shane back. It's good for you to be gone a week just so we know how much we miss you, you know. So, so except when I'm gone a week, they're like, oh, I, you were gone? Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I knew something was different. I just could I knew there wasn't quite as much sarcasm last week for some reason, but... But today we do, we arrive at a story that in pretty much every way is the beginning of the end, for it's not only the final passage of 1 Samuel, it's the final passage, think about this, the final story of Israel's very first king. Uh, A story in a book that, that if you really think about it, uh, is the inevitable result, the the outworking of two prayers, Uh, two prayers that actually frame the entire story of the book and account for everything that we've encountered from chapter 1 all the way until chapter 31 where we land today. The first by a woman named Hannah. Do you remember that? Has it been so long? Uh, And the second by the people of Israel themselves. The first, which was a righteous prayer. It was a prayer of faith. It was a prayer of trust, a prayer of hope from a woman named Hannah who pleaded with God to give her a son and who ultimately gave that son back to God. She called his name Samuel, which means his name is God, right? And she dedicated him back to the service of the Lord. So Samuel begins on a very high note. (laughs) It is definitely a story with ups and downs. Uh, But it begins with this righteous prayer of a righteous woman uh, named Hannah, who was born in some very unrighteous times. If you remember the background of the book of Samuel in these days, when everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And so it should come as no surprise, considering the time and considering that this book is about God's people, and we always have it all figured out, don't we? Uh, That's sarcasm, if you didn't get that one. Uh, The second great prayer of the book, unfortunately, when it comes to God's people, was quite different than the prayer of Hannah. It It was a corrupt prayer. But rather than trusting in God, they willingly chose to reject God. That's what... Praying for a king meant. Uh, They wanted to be like all the other nations of the world and have a king to rule over them, a king to lead them in battle. But more than anything else, like we often like, a king, something they could see with their own eyes, someone they had the illusion of controlling, uh, and someone that they could trust in rather than trusting in God. And so once again, unfortunately, God answered this prayer, just like he answered the prayer of Hannah. They wanted a king, and he gave them a king, a king who was like them in every way, a king who was actually a perfect reflection of both the people and their prayer, a king who trusted his own strength, right, his own might, a king who rejected God and his word, a king who ultimately left a path of death and destruction everywhere he went, everything he did. And so in a way, the story of 1 Samuel is the story of life, I think. It's a story that began with righteousness, with life, with so much promise, right? And it's a story that we find ending today in destruction and in death. Unfortunately, that's what humanity does with life, right? And does with the gifts of God. So that's the two great truths we find in this passage. Uh, But the reason I remind you of this story, not only because we're coming to the end of it, uh, but because there's another truth that we've also found hidden in the pages of 1 Samuel, Uh, that we find especially poignant in this passage, especially meaningful. Uh, And we find it actually throughout the pages of all life, if we have eyes to see it, and that's the greater truth that's hidden in tragedy. Sometimes we look at the tragedy itself, but there's so much more happening there. Uh, Not only the tragedy of the ending of this book, which if you read it, I don't know any other way you could describe it, but the tragedies of all life. And that's what I want to look at today in a sermon uh, that I actually titled and began writing before uh, the events of Wednesday, but I think it fits pretty closely with that. Uh, 
a sermon called The Truth of Tragedy, and we're going to look at it in three points if you want to follow along in your outline. You know, every week I, I think, this, this week I was almost going to make five points just to blow everybody's mind, <laughs> but each point would be just as long, so we would be here for a long time. So let's go ahead and jump in with a first point, uh, the truth of tragedy. So we're going to be looking at the truth of tragedy, the truth of trials, and the truth of time. I didn't read them. I know. i got to read it for you or you you won't read it. So, Uh, But today we have arrived after several weeks. Well, we've kind of been through a roller coaster of events being pulled in every possible direction. What's going to happen to David? No, this week we're going to talk about Saul. (laughs) Right? Not me. It's not my ADHD. It's the writer's. Uh, what's going to happen to Saul? No, we're going to talk about David. Well, now we're finally going to finish the story. Uh, and uh, it, I think there's a good reason why the story of Saul is put off here. If I was the writer, and this was the story of my first king, it was a story that I wouldn't want to tell. And I think this is a story the author almost doesn't want to tell, but he has to. Uh, but but uh, So who can really blame him? But we've already learned back in chapter 28... Uh, That Saul's fate is sealed. It's a done deal, right? And so as we transition into the final final section, this final story, there's a sense of gloom in the air. Uh, If you listen close enough, you could probably hear the ominous and sinister music playing. And you you can talk to the story. Don't go in that room. It's poorly lit and there was a bump in that room, right? I don't know why people in movies are always drawn to the to the bump in the room. I want to get as far away from the sound as I can get. But that's kind of how the scene begins here. You can hear the music playing. And it's not happy music. Something bad is about to happen. We've already been told it's going to happen. Uh, Saul is about to face his final battle. A devastating battle. A devastating defeat not only for Saul, but for all the people of Israel. The results of this prayer that they prayed. And so we read beginning in verse 1. Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Geboa. That's how the story began. You remember the Philistines were whooping up on Israel. But we thought in the middle we kind of got that figured out and we come to a solution, but apparently we haven't because here we're kind of dropped into the middle of the scene and they've already lost the battle. We don't begin at the beginning when they're all pumped up and they're ready to fight. We begin the story and they're already losing. Uh, So we're kind of dropped in the middle of this. And before we even know what's happening, they've already lost. Man, isn't that a metaphor for life? Before you even know you're fighting the battle, you've lost the battle. Uh, Their defeat, much like Saul, it's already kind of a foregone conclusion. They were fleeing before the enemy. They were perishing at the foothills of Mount Gilboa. And if you want to perish anywhere, you don't want it to be at the foothills of Mount Gilboa. Saul's army is crumbling all around him. He can see them falling left and to the right. Just like Samuel had told him back in 28. And as we find, uh, as we continue to read in verse 2, things are only getting worse. We read that the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons. And the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Avi Nadab and Malchisua, the sons of Saul. And the battle pressed hard against Saul. And the archers found him, and he was badly wounded by the archers. It's a tragic scene. I don't know how else to describe it. Uh, as Saul stands there, moodily, mortally <laughs> wounded by the enemy, being shot by these archers. Uh, having just seen his entire army fall, having seen his three sons already dead, and knowing that he's about to die. But to make matters infinitely worse than that, they'd been slain by the very people he was called to get rid of, the very people that he was called and chosen to fight against, a fight that was being waged on this day only because of Saul's disobedience. Only because of his rebellion against God and his obsession with David and seeking out David rather than fighting who the true enemy was, right? And that's what makes it even more tragic. For in reality, it's a story that never should have been. It never should have happened. It was only the result of Saul's sin and rebellion against the will of God. And so as Saul stands there facing the reality of his death, it's it's inescapable. He knows he's going to die. He's faced with the excruciating reality. He has no one to blame 
but himself. And that's the painful truth of rebellion. The truth of the words that God spoke to Adam and Eve in the beginning. That in the day you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. The truth of the words that Samuel had spoke to Saul back in chapter 15 verse 23. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as his king. But the saddest words of all, the words that far too many are going to hear on the day of judgment. When the king of glory, the one who died for the sins of the world, will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Something that never should have been spoken, that should have never been, because Jesus died to redeem us all. And yet it will be spoken to more people than this. Well done, good and faithful servant. Not because God's indifferent, not because God's uncaring. I think the cross has proven that's not the case. But so many will hear it on that day because just like Saul, they willingly chose to reject him. Throughout their lives. Every opportunity they were given. They just went their own way. And they ignored him. They refused to hear while there was still time. And now their opportunity has passed them by. See this is a scene that every day all of us are going to face. Our last day here on earth. Right? And we're going to stand before our maker. And the sad story is far too many. They're going to face an ending just like him, knowing that they're going to spend eternity suffering. And it's only going to be their fault. In Luke chapter 13, we find a story that's similar to this one. A story we've actually talked about before, about another tragedy. Actually, a series of tragedies. Both of which had occurred recently within the life of Christ. The first, if you remember... Uh, as these Galileans were carrying their sacrifice in the temple, these Roman guards under an uh, infamous guy named Pontius Pilate stormed into the temple grounds and they slain the people because they were causing rebellions. Uh, they slain these Jewish worshipers as they brought their sacrifices. Shortly after that, there was another tragedy uh, when the great Tower of Siloam fell and it killed 18 people in its wake. Pretty close to 17, isn't it? Stories much like we hear on the news every day. Think about this. One tragedy from the hand of men that were bent on death and destruction. One tragedy uh, at the hand of nature, if you want to look at it. Fate like that. Uh, two tragedies that had caused people to question God and ask, how could God let this happen? Why would God let this happen? Right? But the painful truth is what Jesus tells them. Do you know what he tells them? He says, you know what, some things in life we just can't understand. No, that's not what he tells them. That is true, but he says, you know what, there's, there's just some, some uh, broken people and they do broken things. That's not what he says. He doesn't give them a way out. He tells them the truth. And so since Jesus told them the truth, I'm going to tell you the truth. Uh, the truth that many no longer want to hear in our world today. Because our hearts have become too hardened. But think about this. Jesus, a man of infinite compassion, who loved us enough to give his life for us, who was willing to go to the cross for us, rather than sympathizing with the people. Saying, you know what, I understand, it's hard. What does he tell them in Luke 13, 5? Unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Unless you repent, you're going to face the same fate as these people. Do you think you're more holy than the people that fell when the tower fell? Do you think you're more holy than those that were slain as they were bringing their sacrifices to God? Unless you repent, you're also going to perish. Now, whether that's the truth that people want to hear in today's world, that's God's truth, right? The reason the world is so broken, the reason this world is so messed up is because we've rejected God. We continue to reject God. And this is what rejecting God looks like. Every time we face another tragedy in America, another fire, another drought, another hurricane, another church shooting, whether it's a, a something, a tragedy of nature or a tragedy of man, people are always looking for answers, right? They're always looking for solutions. 
We've got to control human nature somehow. We've got to regulate morality somehow. Well, guess what? That's not the answer. But we do have the answer as the church. And His name is Jesus Christ. And He is the only answer, the only solution to the problems that are facing our world today. The one and only Son of God who put on flesh, who lived a perfect life, who suffered and died so that He could be the answer to the brokenness of this world. So that He could free us from the wickedness of our own path and our own way. But not only that, so that he could use his church, the people that are called to be his hands and feet, to change the world around us. We're the answer now because he's the answer and we found him. And if we ever want things to change, if we ever want things to truly be different, if we're tired of hearing about tragedies on the news, you know where it begins? The Bible tells us repentance begins in the house of God. It begins by us giving our hearts and our lives over to Him and to His commission. To the task that He's given us as the church. And start doing the task that He's given us. It begins with us turning our hearts towards Him and pleading for God's grace and mercy for us. Because unless we repent, we're going to perish just like them. And pleading for the world around us, right? Because we know that a day of reckoning is coming. And it's going to be far worse than 17 perishing. In fact, we read in the book of Revelations that two-thirds of the world's population is going to die within three and a half years. Think about that. It's going to be a day of judgment unlike the world has ever seen. And on that day, the only people that are going to be able to escape are going to be those who have trusted in Him. That's the truth of tragedy. We've been given one wake-up call after another, after another, after another. The question is, as God's people who say we have the answer, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to continue to sit here and do nothing? Or are we going to be active, changing this world around us? And that brings us to our second truth, the truth of trials. This is a sermon that goes from hard to harder. (laughs) So the opening scene, it's a pretty heartbreaking scene to me. A story, a battle... Uh, Much like the problems of our lives that should have never been. But as we look at this scene a little bit closer, even though it's kind of easy to get swept up in the story of Saul, uh, which is definitely a tragic story, it's tragic enough on its own, uh, if we look a little bit closer, we find an even more difficult truth, I think, for the church. Especially for the people of God as we go through trials, and that's the truth of trials, the reality that even the righteous suffer because this world is broken. For don't miss this, even though he's only mentioned in passing, who's the very first casualty of this war that's mentioned by name? In verse 2, it's the oldest son, it's the would-be heir, it's the one that should have gotten the promise in the kingdom, right, This, this guy named Jonathan. A son that couldn't have been any different than his father. He was different than his father in every possible way. A man who throughout the book of 1 Samuel has been nothing but faithful, nothing but obedient to his father, whether he liked it or not, and to God. A man who was always seen doing the right thing, always seen walking the true path. A man who was eager to pursue the enemy. Remember when his dad called that foolish fast? He was like, why don't we put an end to these Philistines once and for all? He was eager to do the work that God had called him to do. He was zealous for good works, as Paul said. Uh, He was constantly interceding for David and Saul. You know what Jonathan was? He was everything the church should be. And yet within this scene, look at how quickly he's passed over. His death is almost completely unnoticed. He dies alongside of his brothers. He's just another casualty of his father's war, of his father's disobedience. And yet even though he's mentioned in passing, if you think about his testimony, think about all the people that have come and died in this passage. All the people that have lived and died within the book of Genesis all the way until this time. His death truly speaks volumes. This is the Toledot. Do you remember the Toledot? The Toledot of Jonathan. And what is it? He's been a minor character, but I think that's the point. uh, While his father in this scene shows his 
everything that's wrong with this world, the reason why this world is broken, because people choose to go their own way and they reject God's way. What is Jonathan? Jonathan shows us everything that's right with the world. He shows us everything uh, that the church should be. He shows us how to walk in faithfulness, even when the world has fallen, even when our dad has fallen, even when things aren't ideal, right? That's Jonathan's testimony. How to be people of substance, how to be people of faithfulness, how to be people of integrity, how to be people that are truly different because we've been changed by him. How to persist even until the end. As a good soldier, even when you're fighting a battle, you shouldn't be fighting, right? And that's where I think we find the second great truth of this passage, the truth of trials. The reality that even God's people, we have to suffer, we have to go through difficult times. We're not exempt, unfortunately, from tragedy. But even though, just like Saul, we're fighting the same battle... As God's people, we're called to be a part of the solution rather than the problem, right? As we look at this world around us, things are definitely getting worse. They're not ideal. Things are getting worse as a nation, as a culture. We've turned away from God. Just like Saul, we've rejected him. We've rejected his word. We seem to be bent on death and destruction. That's what epitomizes our generation. People don't go to church anymore. People aren't devoted to the Lord anymore. Church attendance is lower than it's ever been. And I'm an optimist, right? Oh, you're talking about all these things, and you're an optimist. But look at what Paul says in Romans 12, 21. Do you know what he says? He says something very similar to the life of Jonathan. He says, the people of God living in the midst of an evil age, we have a choice to do one of two things. We can be overcome by evil, by the evil of this world, by the evil of the culture, by the evil of this age. Or we can do what we've been called to do as God's people. We can overcome evil with good. We can be a part of the solution rather than a part of the problem as we wait for our blessed hope. The glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that brings us to our final point this morning. The truth of time. This sermon, as I read it, uh, as I read this story, there's two things I found very difficult. The first was how to begin the story, and the second was how to end it. It's a hard passage to begin. It's a hard passage uh, to end. The passage that makes us face, I think, some of the hardest truths of of life and the human condition. But how do you end it? I think you end it by considering the bigger picture. That's what we always have to do. What is and what always will be the truth of time. And I think we find that truth in Isaiah 40. That's where I want to end today. I want to kind of give you the background so that you know the the, uh, context of this passage that's so commonly quoted. It says, well, in verses... Uh, or should I say chapters 1 through 39, do you know what the book of Isaiah is all about? Rebellion and judgment. So after 39 chapters uh, of God warning and the prophet warning the people uh, that rebellion is going to cause judgment, and after 39 chapters of the people refusing to turn to God uh, and this judgment coming, this is uh, what God says in chapter 40. Beginning in chapter 40, verse 1, the entire focus of the passage shifts with these words. I think are very appropriate for us today. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. You're going to be carried away in captivity. What do you mean, comfort? That's not the end of it, right? Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended. Her iniquity is pardoned, and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sin. Imagine that. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The words that were spoken when Messiah was coming, Jesus, right? 
And this is what he's going to do. Every valley will be lifted up. Every mountain and hill will be made low. And even the ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Every living person on the earth is going to see this happen. And we have the guarantee of it because God has said it. And not one word he has ever spoken has ever fallen. Finally, in verse 6, it says, a voice says, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. And all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. Something that's here today and gone tomorrow. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And that's the truth of time. God's word is going to happen. One day he's coming back for his church. One day he's going to right every wrong. He's going to lift up the valleys and he's going to crush down the mountains. And even the roughest paths of this road are going to be made straight. The question is, are we going to live in light of his truth or in light of our own? The question is, are we going to continue to live like Saul? Are we going to be overcome by the evil of this world? Are we going to give in? Are we going to do something about it? And that's what I want to leave you with. That's the idea that we are left with at the end of 1 Samuel. How do we want the ending of our story to be? Do we want this to be the ending of our story? Or do we want a different ending? God's already wrote the ending of the whole story. Our ending depends on what we're going to choose. Are we going to choose his way or are we going to choose our own? If you would, please stand and let's go to the Lord. Father, we come before you today in brokenness as we look at the world around us. As we consider what we've become as a people. And we begin by repenting. For every time we've rebelled against you, every time we've went our own way. We pray not only for ourselves, but we pray for this nation. That you would turn us once again back towards you. That you would help us to trust in you. That you would help us to be obedient to you. That you would help us as your people to be the light. To overcome the evil of this world with the good that you've put in our lives. And so I pray today that you would work in the hearts of each and every person here. Convict us where we failed you and help us. Finally, God, I pray if there be anybody here today that has never trusted in you, that you'd speak to their heart right now. That you'd give them the strength to step out in faith and give their whole life and their whole heart over to you. We thank you, God, for the privilege and the honor of knowing you, being able to read your word. And I just ask today that you would do what we could never do. And that you would be what we could never be. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Today as we come to this time of invitation, I want to invite you. You know, this could be the day that you could look back on and say, that's when my life forever changed because I gave my life to Jesus. That's when my life forever changed because I rededicated my life to him. So I want to invite you this time. I know it's something that we do, but you never know if that's your last time on earth. So don't let this opportunity pass you by. As we come, you can pray with me, or if you don't feel comfortable praying with me, kneel at these steps. God will hear your prayer. Thy strength.
small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all 